Well, good morning, church. My name's Kyle, and I have the joy and privilege of being one of the pastors around here. It's good to be together, whether you're here in the room or perhaps online with us today. Hey, given, um, given the subject matter today of one thing, being present, I want to start with uh, a confession. I think it's important for me to do this. Um, I thought for the majority of my life that I was really good at multitasking. I thought I had that on lock. Uh, I thought I did until I got married, whereupon I very quickly learned, and by learned I mean I was told, that I am no good at multitasking at all. I can't do it uh, very well at all. Now that I've been honest, um, I want to ask you, who here thinks they're good at multitasking? Really? All those hands? You're just going to rub it in my face how good you are at multitasking? We'll see about that. We'll see. Uh, I learned the history of multitasking this week. It's, the word has only been around since 1966. And it was initially coined to describe the functions of computers. It wasn't for another 30 years where it started to be used commonly about people. And that people multitask, which means when we multitask, we're a lot more like a computer than a human. Turns out, though, humans cannot actually multitask. And if you're the type of person that likes to think you can, or maybe you're the kind of person that you want to be on your phone, or you're on your phone around your family, or you have like the AirPod in, in a conversation, I'm about to cause some commotion for your life. I'm about to cause some controversy for you. Because nearly every report and study and neuroscientist is calling into question humans' capacity for multitasking. Here's one example from MIT systems and cognitive neuroscientist Dr. Earl Miller, who specializes on learning, memory, and cognition. This is a quote from him. Don't try to multitask. It ruins your productivity. It causes mistakes and impedes creative thought. Many of you are probably thinking, but I'm good at it. This is his words, not mine. That's an illusion. As humans, we have a very limited capacity for simultaneous thought. We can only hold a little, this is his words, only hold a little bit of information in the mind at any single moment. You don't actually multitask, you task switch. This wastes time, makes you error prone, and decreases your ability to be creative. This is where his quote ends. What all that means is that multitasking is a farce. And if you disagree with me, that's okay. You don't have to agree with me, but you're going to have to convince virtually every neuroscientist and study that's been put out over the last couple of years that you know more about this than they do. I know sometimes in life we have to task switch. Sometimes life asks us to go back and forth between things really quickly. But I do wonder if sometimes we force ourselves by our pace of life to self-inflict task switching, multitasking, too much. Forget multitasking. If I'm really honest with you, I struggle with solo tasking. (laughs) I struggle with giving my whole attention to one thing. That's hard for me. And I think it is for many of us. Microsoft researcher Linda Stone described the human condition in these days as one of continual partial attention. Humans live in a state of giving continual partial attention to the things around them. And get this, she wrote that in 1998. Before the smartphone, before social media, before notifications, before the widespread prevalence of Wi-Fi, do we really think we've gotten better at giving our attention to things in the last 26 years? We struggle with giving attention, focusing on the one thing. 
I was talking with Chelsea earlier this week about how hard this message has been for me, how convicting it has been, how challenging it has been looking at this passage. And I was, we're, we're having a conversation about life, about scheduling, about rhythms. And, and I was just saying, this is really hard. And she's like, well, what are you preaching on? And I'm like, I'm preaching on Mary and Martha. And without missing a beat, immediately she was like, oh, no. <laughs> Mary and Martha. It's going to be challenging. Because the table moment that we're looking at today with Mary, Martha, and Jesus punches our city's pace of life and our continuous partial attention living right on the nose. This story of Mary and Martha challenges the fundamental position and posture so many of us live with. The story goes like this, Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. Mary, Martha, and Jesus. Throughout the centuries, that story, uh, and, and, and people in their attempt to explain the story have done all kinds of injustices to the unpacking of it, and especially to Martha, let's be honest. Can you imagine if you're Martha listening to how most people preach this message? Can you imagine the insult that that would be? A lot of folks have made this the comparison between a contemplative life, Mary, and 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 villainizing Martha by saying this is about works and righteousness. It's all about Mary and and, and just kind of throwing Martha under the bus. I, I, I typed earlier this week online, don't be a Martha, just out of curiosity. And it was like blog post after blog post. Don't be a Martha in a Mary's world. Or the opposite, how to be a Mary in a Martha's world. And I just like picture Martha like scrolling and she's like, what do you do? What do you mean? Martha's like, I invited Jesus over. I opened my house to him. I inconvenienced myself. I paid for him and his entire entourage to come over. I made space for Jesus. Do you? Do you make space for Jesus? Do you inconvenience yourself for him? We could not exaggerate how big a deal hospitality was in the ancient world. Not only was eating a meal like being united with someone, like I said, it's like eating a meal would be like having matching bumper stickers, like we're together, that kind of a thing. But hospitality was a huge deal because the way you hosted someone revealed how highly you esteemed them. That was the common understanding in their day. And so when, when Martha was trying really hard to host and to, to put on some hospitality for Jesus and, and the entourage, that was Martha's theological statement saying, look how high I value Jesus. Look how important he is to me. So Martha is putting all kinds of great effort and work to show her value of Jesus. When we look at this and we read in the very few opening words, we see that first century Martha would make a very good modern day Calgarian. Working hard, independent, flipping back and forth between tasks. She's hospitable. She's crushing it. Everything is going good. The pita, the hummus, the olive oil, all getting prepared. Things are going well. Everything's good until, until she looks up. Until she looks up and sees her sister sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, I can't 
prove this from the text, but when I <clears throat> imagine this moment happening, I am certain it didn't start <clears throat> with Martha going to Jesus. It started with Martha in the kitchen doing this to Mary, giving her the eyes, right? And, and I picture Mary like, <clears throat> and then Martha probably would have done this. Hey! Head nod, right? And Mary just blissfully ignoring. And it probably eventually would have been like, Mary, get over here. And Mary going, you invited him. You do it. Eventually, eventually, Martha got pushed over the edge. And if there's any picture in the Bible I personally understand, it's this one. Because I'm the older sibling. I get this. I'm the oldest child in my family. You don't think I, I don't resonate with Martha in this moment? Now, we don't know for sure, granted, we don't know for sure that Mary was the younger sibling, but every older sibling in the room reading this is like, Mary's the younger sibling. <laughs> for sure. For Sure. I've lived this scene a hundred times in my life. Siblings complaining over dishes and chores that need to be done. That's my childhood. Here's another confession. Um, this is, uh, I'm the oldest sibling, like I said. The amount of times in the kitchen, I would be like, I'll wash the dishes. And my brother and my sister would be like, I'll dry. My brother and sister are both a lot smarter than me. And so they would like, oh, I'll dry. Then they'd like go conveniently disappear for a long time. And they would just meander back in when all the dishes were dry and just quickly put them away. They did that for a long time. Eventually, eventually, I clued in. I'm like, I know what they're doing. They're outsmarting me. So I would like wash the dishes and they'd go there and they would be drying. And my brother and sister would just be waiting until they're dry. And shortly before I see them coming back, I would just grab a cup of water and just dump them all over the dishes. Like, <laughs> yes! Now you can wash them and dry them again. <laughs> Fool me 88 times, but not the 89th time. I'm figuring it out. I know this scene with Mary and Martha. I cannot prove that that sibling dynamic happened here. But I can prove in verse 40 when Martha says she was left to do all the work. What that means is Mary abandoned her post. Mary was helping, and then she fled to sit at Jesus' feet. And this is where the intensity ramps up. Because when it says Mary sat at Jesus' feet listening to what he said, we might picture that as like story time in the living room. Like gather around, hear a great, friendly, fun story. But for Mary and for every person in that room, when it says she sat at Jesus' feet, that was Mary assuming the position of a disciple, assuming the posture of an apprentice, and an acknowledgement of Jesus as Lord. It was Mary assuming the position of a student, saying, I'm, I'm with you. Modern language would probably be something like Mary picked up her backpack, walked into the lecture hall, sat front row, took her notebook out, and started to take notes. But what this means when it says Jesus sat at his feet, at the feet of a rabbi, it's way more intense than just taking notes. It means that Mary allowed the words of Jesus to absorb into her heart. That would have been a very provocative moment for everyone that was present. Women didn't go and sit at the feet of rabbis. That was unheard of. Women were not apprentices to rabbis in those moments. Martha was doing everything right. Mary was the one that was taking a step that would have been challenging for everyone there. You know, Friday this week, it was International Women's Day, and I was thinking about that. And if you trace that idea, the equal treatment, the honoring of, of women, if you follow that, orig that idea right back to its origin, you will see Jesus sitting with people like Mary. That whole movement finds its origin in how Jesus 
lifted up and treated all people, welcoming Mary and others to be his apprentice. Previous to that, that was absolutely unheard of. Socially speaking, in this moment, Martha was doing everything right. Mary was the outlier. And so when Martha looked up in the kitchen and saw Mary, she does exactly what I would have done in that moment. After the head nods, after the whispering, after the psst-ing, she goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, help me! Tell my sibling what to do. Tell my sister what to do. It's exactly what I would have done. But before we get to Jesus' brilliant response, this is Martha's exact words. Luke 10, 40. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Now notice the first word, Lord. She starts off really well, acknowledging his authority, acknowledging his lordship. But immediately after calling him Lord, four different times she makes it all about herself. Me, myself, my. And I can't help but be so challenged by how frequently, even in my going to the Lord for help, I make it all about me. All about myself. How often I approach him, Lord, but only to accomplish my plans and not to actually listen to him. How often in this world do we make plans? Do we have hopes? Do we go somewhere, have a dream? How often do we have these ambitions and these desires that the moment they start to go sideways, it might even be doing something for Jesus. We have these hopes and these dreams, and the moment it starts to go sideways, we go to the Lord and say, help me! Help me do what I want to do. Me, myself, help me. Lord, maker of heaven and earth, help me. How often do we have plans in life that we have made without ever actually sitting and listening to what Jesus might have to say to us about them. We learn here that a busy pace of life has a really subtle way to make us more self-centered than we ever want to be. A busy pace of life makes us way more self-centered than we want to be. I don't think I have ever had in the entirety of my life as a disciple, a husband, a brother, a son, a friend, I don't think I have ever had a moment in my life that I'm proud of when I'm rushed or distracted. I don't think I've ever been like, do you see how busy I was there? <laughs> Nailed it. And yet if I were to look at the moments in my life that were most life-giving, most meaningful, most substantial, chats around a campfire, hanging out with friends, the moments that I am most grateful for are the ones where I'm going most slow, where I'm the least distracted. My worst moments are when I'm hurrying distracted. My best moments are when I'm living slow. Martha was in the room with Jesus. It was her house. She hosted him. She was there. But she wasn't actually listening to Jesus' words. Proximity to Jesus in an environment or a room like this without actually just sitting and saying, I want to listen to your word, Jesus, leads us to being pulled away, leads us to self-centeredness. We can do all kinds of things for God in our zeal and totally miss relationship with him. The pace at which so many of us live absolutely rob us from living lives of consequence. 
we live too fast. We live too busy to see things properly. Andrew Sullivan wrote, the reason we live in a culture increasingly without faith is not because science has somehow disproved it, but because the white noise of our culture has removed the very stillness in which it might endure. There's too much white noise in our lives to have a meaningful, robust, growing, intimate relationship. No wonder our relationship with God can be so fractured. No wonder our relationship with those in our lives can be so fractured. No wonder our relationship with ourselves can be so fractured. We simply live too fast. And Martha, in her zeal, says, Lord, Lord, help me. Then we get to the shocking response of Jesus. He responds to this emotionally request with, in verse 41, saying, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. I love the gentleness of Jesus. Martha, Martha, full of love. And we see his sensitivity, we see his kindness fully on display here. Martha comes to him in an emotionally charged state and and, and Jesus just names the emotions that she's feeling. Just names, names exactly what Martha was navigating and he's like, you're feeling this way. Martha was exacerbated and, and, and Jesus named that. Notice that Jesus doesn't chastise her. Jesus doesn't condemn her. But he does say, there is a better way. There is a better way. What Martha was doing wasn't explicitly wrong. People need to eat. Like, it wasn't an explicitly wrong thing that Martha was doing. But Martha was doing it from the wrong place, with the wrong motivations. There was a better option for Martha. Notice, too, that when when Martha comes to him with this request, Jesus doesn't fix it. Jesus doesn't swoop in and, and boss Mary around, saying, Mary, get to helping your sister. Jesus doesn't swoop in and fix it. He just says, Martha, Martha, there is a better way for you. And I imagine Martha was probably a little bit frustrated with that response. She went to him with a problem, and Jesus didn't fix it. And Martha's like, okay, but Jesus, can't you just fix this? Tell my sister what to do? But Jesus loved Martha enough to tell her the truth that she needed to make a change. Nobody in that room would have thought Martha was doing anything less than the best. They all would have thought she was making an amazing theology lesson, showing how wonderful Jesus is. She was doing the socially acceptable thing. She was crushing the hospitality. But then Jesus says, Mary has chosen better. And what she's chosen cannot be taken from her. In our lives, even if every person around us thinks we are crushing it, wow, look at them. Look at that report card. Look at that thriving at that activity. Look at that work production. Look at that home. Look at that. Look at that. Look at even if every person, you know, forget keeping up with the Joneses. You are the Joneses. If everyone thinks you're crushing it, says they're doing the right thing. I want to be like them. Would Jesus say you're choosing the best? Would Jesus say you are focusing on the right things? You're living the right kind of way. My conviction is this. 
for the vast majority of us here that the great temptation is to be like Martha. Not necessarily doing a blatantly evil thing, just not doing the right thing. Hear this well. For those trying to follow Jesus, the greatest temptation is often not the anti-God, it's the almost God. For most trying to follow Jesus, it's not like a blatantly evil thing that's going to hijack your attention or focus. It's going to be the things that seem good. It's going to be the things that are almost good. Good things, but not the best things, are often what steal our attention, what fills our schedules. Corey Ten Boom famously said, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. And I think way too many of us get distracted by our busyness. Do we need to make changes? Do you need to make changes? Are you choosing the best thing? How do we know if we're doing that? Most of us are probably trying to do the best thing and just wondering, am I? Jesus says we are doing the best thing when we are investing our lives in that which cannot be taken away from us. Are you giving your life to things that can't be taken from you? Would your calendar, your rhythms, your schedule, your bank statements reveal eternal priorities? How surrendered are our lives to sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to his word, absorbing his word in a way that absolutely changes our passions and our priorities. So many of us live breakneck speed lives with work, with school, with hobbies, with activities, with clubs, with travel, and then we get overwhelmed and we shout out in a frenzy, Jesus, help, don't you care? Don't you care? What if Jesus' response to you was, choose better? Choose better. It is absolutely shocking to me how rarely Jesus swoops in and fixes problems in the Bible when it's entirely within the capacity of the person to do that themselves. Look throughout the Gospels. When people go to Jesus with a problem, if it's something they can fix, he just says, go talk to that person. Go do it. To a mother about her bickering sons, I'm not getting involved. You can have that conversation. His response to Martha in her exacerbation was, choose better. Because he loves her enough to put the onus of responsibility right back to Martha. Jesus trusts us more than we trust ourselves and our capacity to make decisions. In the busyness of our lives, in the chaos of our schedule, is Jesus saying to you, you can choose better, friend. See, we are all as busy as we choose to be. Our lives are all as full as we choose to be. For our community of FAC, can we not see busyness as a badge of honor? Like, can you imagine on Main Street, after the service, you're out, you're talking to someone, hey, how's it going? And they're like, oh, you know, like, good, I'm busy. Like, just respond by saying, why? Why are you busy? I dare you. (laughs) And then follow it up with saying, is it working? Is it helping? I find it endlessly challenging and remarkably beautiful how much Jesus trusts us to make the choice on how we live. Choose today how you're going to live. We're as busy as we want to be. Now, you might be here today and think, okay, Kyle, nice. That's fun. 
interesting little factoid about the history and the etymology of multitasking. That's cool. I know my life's full. I know my life's busy. I think life probably could be a little bit easier for me, but why should I surrender my hopes and my dreams? Why should I sacrifice my child's schedule when they've got aspirations and passions? Why should I surrender my finances? Why? And why do you claim that it's the best thing? Now, if that's you, if that's what you're wondering, like, why should I actually do this? What purpose is there to actually make this choice? Or maybe that's a cynical version of what you're kind of low-key thinking right now. To you, I say, it's the beauty of Jesus that compels us. It's the beauty of Jesus. There's eight different times in the Bible that someone's name gets repeated. I made a a big deal about it when I was reading it earlier, Martha, Martha. That's why I said it like a handful of times. I was planting a seed that we would notice Jesus saying, Martha, Martha, there's eight times that Someone's name's repeated. Maybe you know some of them. Moses, Moses. This is holy ground. I'm trying to get your attention. Or Abraham, Abraham. I've prepared the sacrifice. Or Samuel, Samuel, I'm speaking to you. Here we see Jesus saying, Martha, Martha. Jesus says her name twice. In a few chapters, when Simon was on the brink of destruction, Jesus says to him, Simon, Simon, the enemy has asked for you, but I have prayed that your faith would endure, that your faith would last. But there's one other time that Jesus says someone's name twice. And we see it in Matthew chapter 27 when he is on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God. Quoting Psalm 22. Why have you forsaken me? And it's because of that very moment where the crushing weight of sin did its worst on Jesus that everything could change for us. Everything can change for us because of that moment. Isaiah 53 describes it this way. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and it's by his wounds that we are healed. And it's because of his life and his death and the resurrection that followed a few days later that Jesus is not just some interesting pilgrim on a road trip at Mary and Martha's house who has a nice invitation saying, hey, can I interest you in a contemplative life that a history book is telling us about? This is the Lord of the universe inviting us to sit with him, to hear from him, Are you tired and weary? Come, 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 come with me. And to invite us to encounter him and then join him in ministry. You know, the beginning of this passage, Luke 10, it says, as they were on their way, like they were on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus stopped and sat and said, come sit at my feet. But then they all got up and they followed him to Jerusalem. Sometimes we want to make this passage, you know, Mary or Martha or Mary versus Martha. But really, I think it's Mary before Martha so that we can live well. We sit with Jesus, we encounter him, and then we join him. But way too many of us are bound by busyness to do that. Busy with doing, but not actually developing anything that lasts. We're busy with performing, but we're not personally connecting. We're busy with activities, but we're not actively bearing any fruit. Would Jesus say to you today, choose better because he loves you? 
Look, this invitation, this has real life implications for each and for every one of us. We live in a world where so often Monday to Friday is school or it's work, with every night having multiple activities with clubs and homework. Saturdays, if we're lucky, they're chores or a tournament or we're traveling or, you know, Sunday morning, we're here. This life has so many demands. Our schedules are often way too jam-packed, and yet for each of us, we are as busy as we choose to be. And are we choosing the best? If we removed an activity or 17 from our lives to sit and absorb the words of Jesus, what would that do to your life? What would that do to your marriage? To the key relationships in your life, to your friends, to your colleagues? What would that do in a relationship with your kids? What would that do for your own emotional vibrancy? If we could just prune back our schedules, our lives would be remarkably better. Are you choosing what's best? In Luke 10, this moment, this isn't just a, a call to step out of a really fast-paced life, slow down a little bit for your own good, take a nap. This isn't just a, hey, everyone, go and rest a little bit more. While that's probably true, every religion, every person, every worldview I know would universally agree with that. Yeah, we'd be better if we slowed down a little bit. There's nothing unique in that message. What Luke 10 is about here is so much more. And I think sometimes we stop short of going to the full and radical gospel message of this table moment with Mary, Martha, and Jesus. Mary and Martha is not just the story of another younger sibling skipping out on dishes and the work and the chores to go and hang out with a friend. This is the story of a woman stepping out of an accepted social order to sit at the feet of Jesus and absorb God's word in a way that changed her passions and priorities. Are we willing to step out of the accepted social order to reorient our lives around Jesus and to absorb his teaching, to follow him. Not by doing, but by being in relationship with Jesus. That's the kingdom picture we're invited into. And the beauty of this the beauty of Jesus extending this invitation is that the, the, to the degree we do this, we are participating in something that can never be taken from us. In a multitasking, obsessed, productivity-focused world, can we step out of the whirlwind to sit with Jesus? Friend, don't invest your life in what is temporary at the expense of what you can have forever. Jesus is inviting you. Choose what's best. Choose what cannot be taken from you. There's probably about as many responses as there are people in this room. I'm not lying to you when I said my wife and I had some real conversations this week about what we're going to do. It's this season of life where you start signing kids up for summer activities. We had conversations about what does our life need to look like to choose what's best. It's been surrendering for us. What's the best thing we can do? What's the best thing you can do? What's Jesus asking you to step into? What pace of life do you need to step out of? When we sit with Jesus and encounter him, we follow him. And it may feel really hard right now and really scary for you to think about stepping back, pulling away from something, choosing something better. But that's why I think how we're ending our service today is, is wonderful. Because right now there's a handful of people right behind those curtains that are waiting for their chance to step into baptism. They've sat at Jesus' feet. They've encountered him. 
And now they are nervously on the brink of taking a step to join Jesus in the waters, a choice that can never be taken from them. And so I invite you in just a moment when they're getting baptized for you to cheer them on at every step of the way. But I also invite you, if you feel like Jesus might be asking you to choose better in a certain area, as you see their demonstration of faith, that you would take heart and take courage to take your next step of faith too. To choose what's better. What does sitting at Jesus' feet mean for you today? Dear friend, choose what's best. Choose what's best because it will matter forever. You will never regret listening to the voice of Jesus. Choose what's best. Choose what's best.